Hi, Enwell. I love this conference because there is no small talk. It's <laughs> my heaven. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I was born an hour and a half north of here to commercial citrus and avocado growers. My dad was a doctor at our local hospital, and my mom ran the ranch. They also rescued donkeys. So anytime um, my uh, dad was in the hospital, we were outside, like running irrigation lines, spreading fertilizer, digging in the dirt. It was a magnificent childhood. It was so beautiful and so strange and so privileged. Um, you really could say that I had absolutely nothing to worry about until I did. When I was three and my dad was 42, he was diagnosed with a metastatic osteosarcoma, which is an aggressive bone cancer. Um, it was the early 80s and he was given a six month prognosis and he was told to say goodbye to us. Instead of doing that, however, um, he pursued early chemotherapy, radiation, and a leg amputation um, at Mayo. And it was miraculous. He actually, he didn't die. Um, first, he lived a year, and then two, and then three, but he had recurrences the whole time. So we lived in between scans. We lived like there was an executioner's ax hanging over our dinner table, and we just didn't know when it would fall. Often his scans would turn up something like a neck tumor here, a leg tumor here, his other knee, um, and then he would go in for more treatment. It was kind of like a sinister version of the giving treat, only he was trading body parts for time with us. And then when I was 11, the cancer came back and he knew it was for good at that point. And that's when he decided that he was gonna train my brother and me for a time without him. And so while other kids were like riding their bikes after school or having play dates, my brother and I were in my dad's version of survival school. And it was like very specific to the things he thought we would need to survive without him. So understanding the Dewey Decimal System <laughs> has not helped me at all. Uh, member nations of the UN has helped me a little bit more. Um, the role of nitrogen and soil health, um, but also like how to scratch a, man, a man's eyes out if I was ever attacked, um, how to also beat a man at pool, which I'm still working on, how to fix a carburetor. Um, there were so many of these lessons. And then he also did a bunch of things to be present for us after he was gone because he knew that that was gonna happen sooner rather than later. Um, so he planted a lot of trees around the ranch where we lived because he knew that they would feed and shade us after he was gone. Um, even though I was only 11 at the time, he went out and he bought a bunch of doves and he put my brother in charge of them, built a little coop and said, you have to take care of these until your sister gets married one day, hopefully a long time from now. <laughs> um, he also became a beekeeper. Um, he knew honey didn't spoil. He knew the ancient Egyptians had used it as a natural antibiotic. Um, and put away the honey um, so that we would be able to stir it into our tea actually to this day. And throughout it all, I knew he was suffering. I knew he was often in terrible pain, but he would not talk about it. Um, he wouldn't let us see him in the hospital. In, in the many years in which he was sick, I never saw him as a quote unquote patient, although I saw him suffer all the time. But if anyone, us or any friends, anyone in our community expressed anything like empathy, he would get angry. For him, empathy and pity were the same thing. And so watching that from age zero through my entire childhood and adolescence, I started to learn that to be strong meant to be invulnerable and to hide whatever pain or suffering I was feeling, because if I showed it, it would be a betrayal of him. And here was this person who was sacrificing everything just to be around to teach me how to change a hose bib. So our family line was you are privileged, you are blessed, which is 100% true, but also you better work very damn hard to take advantage of the advantages that have been given to you. Um, so I did. So I took all of my fears and my anxieties and I threw them into schoolwork 
um, into after school activities, into anything but feeling my own worry or concern. My dad said he would, he would stay alive um, for as long as he could enjoy his life with my mom, my brother, and me. And then when he couldn't, he would die. And I took this at total face value until one day, I was 16 years old now, so he lived 13 years with metastatic bone cancer. Um, I was painting my nails with some friends, and I went into my parents' bathroom cabinet looking for nail polish remover, and I found an unmarked pill bottle with a handwritten note around it with dosage instructions. And I immediately knew that my dad had a terminal prescription, this was it, that he had a plan, that there was a level of suffering that he was not willing to endure, and that's what he'd meant when he had been saying this my entire life. So I wasn't angry, I totally understood, I was scared, surely, but I knew I wasn't supposed to say anything because saying something too would be another kind of betrayal. So I said not a word, I put it back where I found it, tried to pretend like I didn't know, and then six months later, we were on the phone and got into a really big fight. It was stupid. It, he, he wanted me to do my college applications earlier than I wanted to, and I was mad. So I hung up on him. I didn't say goodbye. I didn't say I love you. I just remember the chunk of hanging the phone up as hard as I could. And I didn't know it, but that day he was about to take his lethal medication. And so by the time I got home, he was unconscious, and I would never hear his voice again. So... I dealt with his death by chasing academic honors like a drug. Um, I played Division I college sports, too, in fact, until I, got, I stopped getting my period. Um, I threw myself at life and into life in a way that I, I'm not going to say I regret, but also was so exhausting. Um, I took his hopes and dreams for me, and I lived like it was a to-do list rather than things that I was supposed to enjoy. So I wrote a book, I got my PhD, and by my mid-30s, I was absolutely exhausted. I had spent my entire adult life thus far trying to prove that I was good because someone who is good is not someone who hangs up on their dying dad. I was trying to use achievement and all the nice things that come with it, like a drug, like an anesthetic, on all of the difficult feelings that I didn't want to admit were there. My shame, regret, guilt. But, I hate to say it, you cannot kill shame, regret, and guilt with overwork <laughs> and avoidance, unfortunately. Um, and mine came back with a vengeance. On the outside, I was successful and thriving, and on the inside, I was questioning my worth, I was anxious and scared. I didn't want to keep living like this. I couldn't keep living like this. Um, and so I decided I wanted to change. But how on earth do you do that? I'm a writer and a researcher, or I was then. So I set out to interview many grief specialists who were in this room. <laughs> it was always hypothetical. What would you do if? Um, but I started doing some of this work. Um, I did everything that they told me, because I still I was my coping mechanism is goody two-shoes. And I even went out into the wilderness um, with no food and no tent to do something that did scare me, which was to be alone with my thoughts and feelings, even the ones that I found the most uncomfortable and nothing to distract me from them. I got very bored, very dirty, uh, very much in need of coffee, and I realized what scared me the most wasn't even my most negative feelings. It was love. Love is the gateway to negative feelings. <laughs> Here, yeah, because you can lose it, right? I hate love. I hate caring about anyone or anything. Um, and I knew that that couldn't stand. I wanted to live the kind of life that I knew my dad had actually wanted for me, a big, brave one. And to do that, I was going to need to understand that courage looked different. So I heard about a grief support organization for kids and I became a facilitator, a volunteer at that organization. It's called Josie's Place. It's in San Francisco, wonderful organization. And I immediately felt less alone because I walked in and I saw that all of these kids who were there thought they were bad too. 
So many of them had been out of the room playing when their mom died, or they'd said something in anger to another parent that they regretted. They blamed themselves, and I could see looking at them that the terrible things that had happened to them weren't their fault. And because I could see that, I began to see that what had happened to me might not have been my fault too. The kids were doing something that I think many of us do, which is it's easier to blame yourself, even though that's painful and uncomfortable, than admit that bad things can happen for no reason at all. The kids taught me some of the most important lessons from this journey that ended up being a kind of seven year both project and just time in my life. They also taught me that, you know, the worst thing that you can do when you're sad is try not to be sad, <laughs> which sounds basic, but I spent years trying to not pay attention to. Um, also that if you feel guilt, it's not because you necessarily did something wrong, or if you feel regret, it's not necessarily because you should have acted differently. So here I was learning all of these things. Life is nothing, however, if not a sushi conveyor belt of things that are going to test you and teach you at the same damn time. So first I lost my dad, and then we lost my family house uh, to wildfire. And we didn't just lose the house and a third of our trees, but we lost um, everything that my dad had worked so hard to prepare and to save for us. And then, two years after that, I lost my mom. Also to cancer, but quickly this time. Um, she chose right to die too. But because we'd had the experience we'd had with my dad, we vowed that this time it would be totally different. No one would be left wondering if they'd messed up or if she knew how they really felt, um, if, if she understood how much he'd meant to them. We decided to do a kind of goodbye or send off or living memorial, whatever you would want to call it, um, for her, where we each took turns saying how much she'd meant to us and meant in our lives and wishing her a good journey and what we hoped for her. And it hurt like the Dickens, you know? Also, it was so beautiful. Like if you can swing it, everyone gets, deserves a chance to say goodbye and good luck. And I learned in this process that death is a doorway, not a destination. No matter what you believe about the afterlife, as soon as you die, you immediately start being something else. Another form of life. I saw this up close because a year after my mom died, we decided to spread her ashes over the, or the lemon orchards that she'd planted 45 years earlier. And we used a friend's crop duster. This is the same kind of plane we used to fertilize or spray the trees. And we had to mix her with a 10 pound bag of gold metal flour because human remains are not enough to see from an airplane, which is a fact I never thought I would need to know. Um, and she, her ashes, her, ended up being spread over the trees, over our soil. They were pulled up into the roots of the trees. They were incorporated into the lemons. And then, because we eat the lemons, they became us too. And actually, if you shop at Safeway, also maybe you. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't tell the USDA. Uh, so... By spending so many years of my late teens and early adulthood trying to outrun or outwork my own negative feelings, I missed a very, very important lesson, which is that you cannot have joy without pain. You cannot have bravery without fear. You cannot have resilience without challenges. You cannot have life without deaths. These things are not opposites, they are partners. And it's never, never too late to re remember that every heart's a phoenix being born from the ashes of what we love again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you.